Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. Uh, tonight is going to be more of a casual night again. Um, I'm just calling it the Soda Stream for now because that's where I'm from, Minnesota. So trying to keep it a little bit more casual, trying to get my stream hours up as I as I reach for affiliate. Uh, so I think tonight what we're going to do is just I'm going to pick some videos to, to watch and kind of react to and, and hopefully you all can join in. Uh, and I, I welcome your, your commentary. You know, this is, this is gonna be pretty casual. This is not like the the Friday nights where it's more educational. This is this is more informal. So feel free to chime in with whatever comments you have. And um, I think the first thing I'm gonna do tonight is I'm gonna bring you a video, which is the well, well, it, I mean it amounts to the meta 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 commentary on the the. Uh, widely publicized Richard Wolf versus Destiny debate that happened just about a week ago. Uh, so it was hosted by Lance of the Serfs, and then it was also put onto uh, YouTube by the Rational National, so he did some commentary on that. And we're going to watch Mike from PA reacting to uh, the Rational National's coverage of <laughs> the the wolf v destiny debate and uh the reason i'm doing it like this i mean aside from just being kind of fun uh is uh, what i'd like you to see is um you know mike from pa has been kind of a, a controversial figure as of late he's gotten himself into some pretty dumb uh dust-ups with other leftists and has has not presented his arguments very well in, in a way that looks that makes it look like he's being good faith Instead, he's he's attacked people's personal characters and just kind of, uh, you know, anyone that disagrees with his take on um, the canceling of, of other leftists, he ends up going after them as well. But there is another side to Mike, and, and that is the side that has insightful political commentary when it comes to things like uh, political philosophy as, as well as critiquing people who are on the right, which I, in, for this case, I would include Destiny in that since he is defending capitalism, which is basically a, a, a right ideology. It believes in uh, hierarchy in the workplace. So, but what I liked about this debate too was, was much more than, than Destiny's performance or even Mike's commentary was Richard Wolff's uh, laying out of his ideas. I think he did a pretty good job Destiny kind of heckled him through the entire thing to uh, define and define and define. And even though he did that, uh, he, you know, it was, it was never enough. So his, his little debate tactic didn't really work out. But it did work out for Richard Wolff. I think he, he puts out some pretty good distinctions when it comes to things like what makes uh, something socialist, what makes something capitalist, and uh, why is one preferable to another. And he, he you know, he treated it more like a lecture. Uh, whereas Destiny treated it definitely as, as kind of a debate bro, kind of gotcha, I'm going to put you in the corner and then slam whatever you've said previously um, to score points sort of debate. But anyway, let's, let's uh, get right to the video here, and we're going to play it right now. So let me know what you think about it. Um, I think Mike had some pretty good comments, and uh, I'll be adding my own. Let's mold in the Central Committee Let's cringe in the Central Committee Let's bog in the Central Committee right now You know what? Fuck it. I know that everyone's gonna be mad at me, but this is not gonna be a drama thing. You know, if it becomes too stupid, we could always quit, you know? I don't typically do these react debate shit. I don't typically do this stuff. But because I really like Professor Wolf. I, I mean, we've had a Wolf emote for how long? Of, Get like, some DSA Wolfs in the chat. Like, we've had, we love Professor Wolf. This is why I'm interested in it. All right, let's watch this stupid shit. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's competitors. Argue oh, and by the way, this is a condensed version of the, uh, or an edited version, I should say, of the entire debate that it, the whole debate was something like three hours long, and that would be a whole lot to get through in one night, since I'm only going to be streaming for a couple hours tonight. Um, so 
I thought this was a, a better way to kind of cover the ground and, and look at the ideas that are being laid out, uh, while at the same time, you know, getting to the meat of it as well. Arguing in favor of socialism is Richard D. Wolff, a professor of economics who's previously taught at Yale and is also the host of Economic Update as well as Democracy at Work. He's authored several books on both Marxism and socialism, as well as a recent one covering the COVID epidemic called The Sickness is the System. Arguing in favor of capitalism is Stephen Bunnell II. No Juice in his gamer brain with Red Bull. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. That's my first reaction. Known under the pseudonym Destiny, he began as a professional StarCraft II player and went on to revolutionize politics on the Twitch streaming platform. He's gone on to debate many of the largest public figures on both the right and the left corners of the political spectrum. Recently, he's been uh, become involved in campaigning for local politicians and well as the track. By the way, chat, how did his campaigning for local politicians work? Uh, he supported Mark Mark Good Gal, right? What, what what was? How did he do? Wait a minute. Oh, and there's you know, see already, Mike is a. Uh bringing his personal beef into it. Like Destiny doesn't need to have any, any additional reasons to dislike his uh, debate style uh, or the things that he brings up. But Mike's bringing up a petty squabble from before where just because Destiny, I mean, it, it by, by all accounts, what it looks like is just because Destiny supported a particular candidate, I believe it was in Nebraska, Mike supported the opposite candidate uh, or... And not the opposite candidate, but or a different Democratic candidate for a particular seat, um, just to spite them because they have a beef that goes way back. So, yeah, I mean, it, it really doesn't add to Mike's critique either by bringing this up. But, you know, he just can't help himself sometimes. And, and that's something I wish he would he would uh, get better at because I think he'd be a much stronger force. Um, you know, perhaps his, his chat likes this sort of drama stuff and, and kicking up dust and and you know beefing with people and stuff like that but it only serves to shred his integrity really so let's let's continue. destiny's endorsement was taken down what happened he used to be on the wikipedia page when was it edited that should be restored so i was cringe because i supported bernie sanders remember that chat i'm cringe because i support bernie sanders but finishing fifth out of five I'm sorry. I had to stop that because the surfs called Destiny involved in local politics. So I had to see how that went. Sorry about that. Tractors on both sides have labeled him either a communist or a fascist. He prefers the moniker as the omni liberal. Can I? Okay, I want to stop right there. The reason why Destiny calls himself an omni liberal because this is his this is his debate tactic. He employs what's known as the Socratic method, which puts you in the learned, wise position and you just ask questions of the person, right? You never actually advance anything. You never actually have a position to defend. You just try to find the weak points in your opponent's argument because they have an actual position. They have an actual belief system. Omniliberalism basically means he doesn't have to defend anything because he made it up. And it's whatever he needs it to be in the moment. There's a really good video by uh, Innuendo Studios on these debate tactics. You should really check it out. His, uh... And see, this is where he has good critique of, of Destiny. He, he has called himself the omni-liberal because, you know, so many people have thrown labels at him. And he just can't keep up with what he is this week and uh, you know, all this whining and stuff. Um, but really what he is is a neoliberal. You know, what, what, that, what that ends up coming down as, as a neoliberal. He's... he's really big on capitalism. He doesn't seem to mind some socialist ideas such as, as worker-owned cooperatives, but, you know, when it comes down to it, he, he definitely prefers uh, just traditional capitalist institutions with, with maybe a little bit of social safety nets uh, thrown in uh, to, to, well, I mean, basically what it does is, is put a Band-Aid on a, on a bullet wound, but in, in his mind, that's, that's enough. Because I think when it comes down to it, Destiny believes in... in these sorts of ideas, like uh, like the great men of history, who you know ha are are just head and shoulders above all their competition. You know, people like Elon Musk, who you know they, they they're so brilliant that their their genius cannot be contained. So they're they're do whatever accolades and whatever money comes their way, and we all should just basically be so lucky to attach ourselves to to such a, a figure and and hope that they shake a few crumbs our way whenever. Uh, whenever they can. 
So I, I think that's really core to his his belief system. So this is actually a good critique of him. Oh, let's see. Uh, let's see, I got a, a comment from uh, Kumotaja. I hope that's how you pronounce your name. Do you care why Destiny calls himself the Omniliberal? I mean, not really. It, it seems like just another debate tactic. It's it's one of those things like I can, I can put a label on myself uh, and call it whatever I need it to be in the moment. And that gives me room, in, in especially in debating, where especially in uh, Destiny's tactics, the idea is to pin down someone to a, a set of definitions and then destroy those those definitions. So if you can't be pinned down, it seems like a good way to, to get around his own debate tactics. So I, I don't particularly care. I think it's pretty clear, especially in, in this debate, what he believes in, um, no matter what he calls himself. So neoliberalism, I, I'm 100% sure, I'm pretty confident in saying that is at the core of Destiny's beliefs, at least how he's presenting them in this debate. Now, he may not believe everything that he's saying in this debate, um, but, you know... What, what else can you go from, really? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to watch hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of Destiny to, to find any more nuance than, than, what I present, than what he's presenting here, because, well, I mean, we're just talking about this debate as well. So at least in this debate, he's presenting himself as a neoliberal, no matter what he calls himself. Uh, Which... His tactic me, seems more like debate via interrogation as opposed to Socratic. That's probably more fair, Admiral, uh, Admiral Coffey. I'm being too good faith. Richard Wolf. Okay, in the three minutes I have, I cannot speak as fast as you just did, so I won't even try. I'll try to make a couple of basic points. Every economic system in the history of the world displays the following pattern. It is born, it evolves over time, and then it dies and passes away, giving way to another one. And part of that process has always been the conviction of the people in each economic system that sooner or later they can, they should, and they will you, Master do Birdman. better, overcome some of the problems and difficulties they're facing, and organize a system that better meets human needs. The process is sometimes relatively smooth, other times it's rocky. That varies with the conditions and particularly with the level of resistance from those who don't want to see the system change and shift. Great points by Wolf. Capitalism, in my judgment, has been born, most would agree, has evolved over the last three centuries or so, and is now at that last stage. The only question now is exactly how and when the red the bull passing man. occurs. I don't think he makes a really good case for that. Um, if you've seen any of the work that Richard Wolff has done before, basically what he lays out is is that uh, essentially since the, the point in American history where unions began to decline, the working class began to uh, get less and less power, uh, basically the neoliberal era, starting with you know the area, the era of, of like uh, Reagan and Thatcher, uh, until the, the the very near past, um, where we're still basically coming out of this neoliberal period. Uh, there's just been a stagnation in wages. There's there's been a, a stagnation in quality of life for the people at the bottom, and this is a symptom of a system that is is starting to grind down, uh, a system that is in decline and is running out of, of new places and new people to exploit. So I, I think he makes a pretty good case for the, the idea that, that capitalism is coming to uh, an end. It's grinding to a halt little by little. And, uh, you know, I guess, uh, as he says, the only question is, is when and, and how exactly it all comes down. Likewise, in my judgment, the yearning for something better has built up in capitalism kind of want to speed up to the time, a pretty Jack, intense but... level now whether you look at the debts of students whether you look at the mind-bending inequality that this system generates over and over again unless and until it is revolted against by masses of people who do something about the inequality only to discover that as long as capitalism remains the tendency to inequality resumes. 
I think people are also tired of the instability. Every four to seven years, capitalism crashes. We've had three in this new century in its 20 years. Yep, right on schedule every four to seven years. Millions lose their jobs. Businesses go belly up. Cities and towns can't get the revenue they need to provide the services we depend on. One sign of the exhaustion of this system, a level of money creation, a level of debt creation, we have never seen. Government debt, corporate debt, personal debt. The system is exhausted. And the entire private enterprise system is now on 24-7 government life support. I think it's over. I think that's difficult for us all to live through. And we better learn some lessons from the British Empire from which they have been tumbling for a century. We could and should do better on the downswing than the British have been able to. And the more we talk about it and discuss it and explore it, the better our chances to make another progressive transition to a better system that we all need and will benefit from. I would have to agree with him there. Um, and I would say that definitely the rise of figures like Bernie Sanders and events like Occupy Wall Street and, and stuff like that have, have really brought these sort of, you know, I guess they were basically thought dead by the, the champions of neoliberalism, these ideas of socialism, of, of communism, of anarchy, of, of basically actual left ideas, they, they've brought them back into the public conversation. Um, so, I, I mean, for me, it's kind of exciting times to live in that we're actually at a point where we can start talking about this sort of stuff again. And I mean, the first step towards making any sort of change is, is to figure out what sort of change you want to make. And that's hard to do when, when you know, you have terms that are so stigmatized that, that it's, it's, you know, not even worth considering in most people's minds. You know, it would, it would be as worth considering as, uh, as a, you know, a far-right ideology in most people's minds. Okay, so another comment here. Would you say that Scandinavia is neoliberal? Um, I don't actually know the, the specific breakdown. I know they have a lot more worker-owned cooperatives than in uh, just by... Okay, one more uh, comment here. Just read what Destiny means by omniliberal from his homepage. That's okay. He supports the Nordic model. Well, that would be a lot more support for things like worker-owned cooperatives and uh, things like very strong unions, a lot of social safety nets. And, and that's great if, the, if he actually does support that sort of, of thing. But I think what Wolf wants is even more. He wants the dominant form, like as, as you will hear in the debate later on. I hope he gets to that part uh, in this, this series. But uh, what, what Wolf wants is more for socialism to be the dominant form. And in, in his mind, what socialism is, and, and I would tend to agree, is the workers owning the means of production. And one way to do that is uh, to have a worker on cooperative where everyone makes decisions collectively. Uh, not, not every single decision. There are still management. There is still division of, of jobs and labor. But things like compensation, like uh, working conditions, like the number of hours and the number of days that uh, employees expected to work, all those things are decided democratically. Uh, you can't buy, you know, 51% of a worker-owned cooperative and decide to replace the board because there is no board. All, all the workers are functioning as the board. Um, you can't tell the company what it needs to do in terms of compensation. You, you don't really have any direct control, um, even if they were to offer non-controlling shares in, in such a cooperative, which, as Wolf points out, is a, is a possible model. There's no reason you can't have non-controlling shares as, as uh, a way for people to invest in a cooperative and, and basically gamble on whether or not it's going to uh, do better and, and you know be able to return them a profit through uh, selling those shares later on. Um, okay, so safety nets are not neoliberal, you would say. I, I would say that's definitely true. Uh, they, they're not within the, I mean, neoliberalism, neoliberalism would, would tend to argue more that safety nets are unnecessary because we already live in some sort of meritocracy and the cream is always going to rise to the top 
you know, it believes these sorts of myths. So yeah, they do tend to um, push away from uh, more uh, social safety nets. So I, I get that that is definitely true. Um, that's not what I saw Destiny arguing for in, in this sort of debate. But of course, we didn't really get all that far into it because he got so much, he got so hung up on definitions and, and uh, got so frustrated with with. Wolf taking his time to actually lay out uh, what he thought in a nuanced and, and comprehensive way, as much as, as can be possible, in a, in a short debate format. So it, it's possible we could have gotten to that point where Destiny would said, oh yeah, I too believe in social safety nets. But, you know, again, as I see it, and I'm not, a, I'm not I wouldn't call myself definitely a Destiny fan, so I, I'm familiar vaguely with his work. I, I, I have some uh, I've watched some of his videos. I've, I've seen him debate other people as well. Uh, so I don't, I'm by no means an expert on, on what Destiny thinks, but at least in this debate, I didn't see much in the way of saying social safety net um, or worker on cooperatives for that matter. Like he, he seemed to be okay with the idea, but, but still even leaning away from that sort of a model uh, because he didn't see it as uh, being as much of an engine of, of profit and and growth as your traditional capitalist uh, autocratic basically setup and top down setup. Anyway, let's continue. Okay, Destiny. All right. As of March 2021, Americans rank the economy, job markets, the handling of the coronavirus, and leadership in Washington as the four most important challenges facing our country. Socialist policies would not alleviate any of these concerns. That's just not true. Uh, socialist policies would allow things uh, like uh, more generous uh, time off from work. Um, you know, if you if you have control over your workplace then you don't have to worry as much about getting laid off because there's uh, a work stoppage because of um, something like a coronavirus popping up. So already, it's not off to a good start. Countries have tried. Starting off your debate with a opinion poll about what people rank as important and then immediately going to an assertion that socialist policies wouldn't help any of those things from a single... This is... Really? That's your... Okay. Well, yeah, and he doesn't really flesh out why socialist policies, policies would not help that at all. And it's pretty ridiculous. You, you look at uh, most of the countries that did best in, in response to the virus, and well, not all of them were socialist. You certainly had countries like New Zealand and, and South Korea... Um, all of them had better social programs. You know, they at least had socialized health care, for one thing, uh, which itself is not technically socialism. Like, you couldn't just say that any country that has socialized health care is a completely socialist country. Uh, socialism, first and foremost, refers to the economic system rather than anything to do with government or policy or anything like that. Uh, but it definitely is a component of a socialist society. Socialist societies are going to want to look to take care of their people and their basic needs. Um, usually they're going to do that through, I mean, in the modern day, through government policy, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be through uh, smaller collectives. It could be through just any sort of organization that, that people form, um, you know, any sort of free, a social, uh, free association. Uh, to to fill those needs, but but still, you know, you, you definitely there, there's basically two components, and and they didn't really get into the the social or governmental one as much. But there's basically two components to socialism. One is the economic, and that's kind of the important part um, to actually call yourself a socialist state. And then there's the the uh, I guess the the cultural part, the governmental part, however you want to 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 call it where you provide for the, the welfare of the people. You make sure that things are equitably distributed. You prevent people from hoarding to the point where they're har harming other people, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, well, socialized medicine definitely is a component of a, of a, a robust and, and well-functioning socialist state. It does not a socialist state make, I would say. 
Uh, what about Sweden? Uh, Sweden, I think, is even even more so. I think Sweden, probably more than any country, has has adopted things like uh, worker-owned cooperatives. And I'm not I, again, I'm not an expert on this. This is just from what I remember from my reading and, and watching uh, other people talk about it. But yeah, I'd say they're probably the furthest along in the what we would call social democracy, which would be just one step removed from democratic socialism. You know, they haven't quite taken the entire plunge. They still depend a lot on uh, policies of imperialism to get a lot of their goods, uh, especially things like oil. You know, they don't produce it all themselves. Um, so there is still exploitation of other countries, which is more of a, a capitalist uh, feature. Uh, they still depend on continuous growth, as far as I know, although I, I would doubt it's it's anywhere near the level of like uh, the USA or anything like that. Um so yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that they are a socialist nation, but they're they're about as, as close as you can get in uh, Western countries, and and definitely it's it's something worth shooting for. I would say in in places like the United States, other countries that haven't quite in, quite got that far yet with uh, building up their safety nets. I think that's a good step towards a, an actual uh, socialist form of economy uh, because it gets people used to the idea of caring for one another. Um, uh, things like destroying myths of, of like the great men of history and, and, and natural hierarchies and, and all these other things that, that uh, capitalists like to prop up to justify keeping the power that they have had, usually generationally, uh, intergenerationally, I should say. Um, so, so definitely it is a, a stepping stone. You know, Some people argue that it's, it's kind of like an easy chair and once you get into it, it it's hard to get back out. Uh, and, and move things even further along, but uh, I think it's definitely worth uh, uplifting millions, or uh, I suppose at this point it'd be billions of people, uh, to a much better level of of just uh, meeting their their at least their basic material needs. I think that's definitely a worthy goal, uh, even if it takes a long time to to make that final push. Uh, but anyway, I digress a little bit there. Um, what is your opinion on Wolf having flimsy definitions of socialism in this debate? I think that's absolutely not true. I think, as we will see, he comes with three definitions, and he, in fact, picks out which one he agrees with most. He, he tries to point out that socialism is a very broad and, and rich history, and that people have disagreed, uh, and there's been, there have been multiple schools of thought about what constitutes socialism. So the three that he's going to lay out um, are... The idea of, of just the social democracies, what, what most people would now call a social democracy, where you have robust social programs and a robust safety net for people, but you still maintain the, the uh, owner-worker dynamic. Uh, and then there, his second definition is more what some people might refer to as state capitalism, where the state acts as the capitalist. And in theory, you could have a... a uh, a, a, you know, a dictatorship of the proletariat, like uh, a government actually made up of the people making those decisions. So, so in effect, the people would directly own the means of production. It would just be more of, I suppose you call it a nationalized system of, of distribution and production. Uh, but even if it doesn't shake out that way, even if it is just select party members being able to control the means of production, uh, you might call that state capitalism today. I think I'd, I would tend to be in that camp that would define it as such. Um, so, so not quite what I would call true socialism, but he's, he's still trying to lay out that this is, this has been a, a, a viable and legitimate definition uh, and still remains as such for a number of people. And then his preferred definition, which, which I would tend to agree with, is doing away with the owner worker dynamic entirely, the, the, the contract of, of labor for compensation from the owner of the means of production, and instead just having people own the means of production directly and democratically control them. You know, as, as, as I laid out just a few minutes ago, not every decision is made collectively, but the, the major ones like compensation, like scheduling, like um, uh, working conditions, those sorts of things, those are managed. Um, and, and, and things like, uh, as they talk about later, uh, the 
if if you're going to have a hierarchy of compensation based on specialty or expertise or anything like that, how much more the top level employee can make than the bottom level employee. These, these sorts of things would be uh, made collectively if if the organization wants to um, raise capital for a future endeavor. That would be decided democratically. These sorts of things. So not everything, but but just a little bit. Or I'm not just a little bit. The the, the major important things. And then the running of the, the business otherwise is just as you would see in any other organization, except for you don't have the board of directors. You don't have an owner that can just kick back, not do any labor themselves, and still collect a paycheck. You know, everyone still is, is putting into the organization, basically. Mm-mm-mm. Yeah, I, I wouldn't consider uh, uh, state capitalism or social democracy to be true socialism. And, and Wolf points that out. And I don't know if Destiny just wasn't paying attention at that point or he was intentionally pretending to not pay attention as a debate tactic so that he could later, uh, just through his rhetoric, make it look as though Wolf was being wishy-washy in his decision. But he, he definitely said, this is my preferred decision. He said it more than once as well. My preferred definition, I should say, it, what Wolf said um, is that socialism is is the workers owning the means of production. I would tend to agree with that. I think that's that's always the thing that we should be sh- be shooting for. Um, and even if it takes those other stages to get to it, I think that's still uh, the first end goal to ending capitalism as as the predominant form on the earth. Okay, uh, so Linky RD says, I think there's more to socialism than just worker-owner means of production. Market socialism, for example, is still capitalism. I, I would tend to disagree with that. I, I think the thing, and I, I would I would agree with, with Wolf in this regard, that uh, capitalism is having an owner who owns the means of production, and they make contracts with workers. You don't have to swear fealty as you would in a, in a lord and serf arrangement. You are not bound as another piece of property, as in a master and slave arrangement. Uh, it, is, it is the owner and worker uh, dynamic, the, 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 the interaction that, that makes capitalism. So if you do away with that in a worker cooperative, you have, at least for that organization, socialism. And you still may be swimming in capitalist waters, so to speak. You still may be having to compete with other capitalist businesses. I, I mean, you know, in, in this day and age, at least in, in my country, the United States, that's going to be the case. The, the, the worker on cooperative is still quite rare. I can think of uh, maybe one in my, my local area. And then I know there is a couple in one state over in Wisconsin. There's the uh, Organic Valley Cooperative, which I believe is also worker owned. And there is the Ocean Spray Cooperative, which is worker owned and managed, uh, worker owned, that is. Okay, what else you say in here? So yeah, so th- as, as Wolf is trying to point out and Destiny, you know, likes these clear divisions, it has to be either social, a socialist economy or a, a capitalist one. Uh, you know, one drop of socialism doesn't make it socialist and and that's true but at some point there there would be a tip over at some point when you get past i don't know 50 percent let's just say let's just throw that out as the dominant form is a a socialist um economy then you would have a socialist economy even if it, you still had elements of, of capitalist uh, production like i could imagine a society where we're never going to get rid of things like the mom and pop shop like there's there's no reason to destroy that sort of an institution and make you uh, have to enter a cooperative agreement with your your partner or your children um so that there may be some cutoff where say above 10 employees let's just say uh, then it, at that point, it becomes uh, such an uneven distribution of power that you are forced to uh, cooperatize. But anything below that, you could you know, kind of fly under the radar and still have the capitalist system. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that because the, as, as they're called on the left, the, the petite bourgeoisie, uh, the small business owners, they don't really have enough power to affect uh, major parts of the the country or even their their local area usually um 
it's only once they become at least medium size, where they're the dominant employer in, the, in a region and they can just throw their weight around and, and say, like, threaten a, a municipality and say, give us all these tax breaks or, or we're going to leave, you know, or, you know, don't you, uh, you know, don't regulate us anymore because we, we provide all these jobs and we're going to have to close if you if you have to, you know, tell us where we can dump our, our waste or whatever like that. At that point, you know, you start having an outsized force on your local political environment. Uh, so at that point, I'd, I'd say it would be better for them to be uh, collectivized into worker-owned cooperatives. <laughs> okay, the dynamics of, of corporations still exist that exploit smaller markets. Well, that, that's definitely true. And I, I think that's kind of what I was trying to get at right there. You can still have, you know, medium-sized companies that, that, that exploit people. And you can still have very small businesses that, that technically exploit people. Uh, however, if, if the dominant form is worker-owned cooperatives, you're probably going to, at least one, have a lot more options as a worker to, to gain uh, a more powerful seat at a different table than the one that you uh, perhaps are working at. And, and, and two, like I said, it's just never going to be enough power to completely screw everyone over like i think the the worst i mean the worst offenders in the capitalist world are are definitely the ones at the top you know the ones that produce the most pollution the ones that drive the most imperialism and war and and uh, unfair trade agreements so on and so on the people that are doing the most damage to the system at a whole i think is where we got to focus first at least so maybe maybe it's someday uh once uh, worker-owned cooperatives would be the dominant form, then you can reassess and say, oh, maybe these these smaller ones, they should have a, some different form that's not quite as exploitative. I could see that for sure. Uh, but at this point, they're just not, there's bigger fish to fry. Let's just put it that way. I think there's a lot more important things, especially as, as climate change ramps up, uh, especially as, as wages in general stagnate for the working class. Um, and as they get further and further behind, the more and more just unfathomably wealthy, the people that that have the that personally have basically the GDP of uh, small nations. I mean, that's just ridiculous. That, that's that's way too much power for anyone to have. I, I don't think there's any justification for that level of power for any one person or even a handful of people to have. So I think that's where we got to focus, basically. Okay, um, so Link, Linky RD says, I agree that worker co-ops are more preferable to the current system, but I don't think that they should be the end goal uh, even now. Well, I wouldn't say it's the end goal. The end goal is, is definitely somewhere past that point. But I think we would definitely have to break through that left wall of capitalism uh, to the point where we actually have some form of socialism before we can start really even thinking about going beyond these sorts of economies altogether to something more like a, a you know, anarcho, an ar, anarcho-communist relationship uh, to each other or, or a, even a centralized communist one where you have centralized committees uh, controlling the, the flow of, of goods and services. You get past a, a moneyed economy and you go more towards a needs-based economy, that sort of thing. I think we at least need to get past capitalism before we start getting into that territory, though. So definitely socialism is not the end point. Probably, you know, if we ever to get to the point where um, any sort of actual leftist uh, ideology like communism or anarchy were the dominant forms, that probably wouldn't be the end. There's no end of history. You know, there's, there's no point where we're going to get to the most equitable, the most um, fair and, and balanced system that provides for everyone possible. There's always going to be flaws in the system. I mean, in, in no small part, because people are flawed and not everyone's going to have the same expectations or the same motives in mind. Uh, the idea is just making a system that most people can get behind and, and works for the, the greatest number of people, at least to begin with, and then kind of work your way out from there. That's, that's what I would say. Uh, so you have a quote there as well. The hell of capitalism is the firm, not the fact that the firm has a boss. Well, absolutely true. Absolutely true. And, and, and when we're talking about all of this stuff, it's important to keep in mind that it's really the systems that allow 
the Jeff Bezos's, the the Bill Gates's, and the Elon Musk's of the world to survive, uh, to survive not only uh, survive but also thrive and amass these ungodly amounts of wealth. That's that's really the problem. Uh, um, so it's the system that needs to be changed more than than the individuals. So, you know, it's fun to get it. It's fun to get mad and 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 hurl insults at, at people like uh, Elon Musk and whatever. And he, you know, there, there's plenty of good reason to do that sort of thing. Uh, especially when he's doing things like union busting, which he's been doing recently, got got caught doing that. Um, but it's, but more so, it's important to keep your eye on the actual system that that's to blame for for all of this happening. So, thank you very much for your, your comments so far. They've been they've been uh, very helpful and in good faith, which I like. It's, it's a change from what I've uh, been getting lately a lot. You know, when you when you stream on the the politics uh, category in Twitch, you tend to get a lot of people in here who <laughs> just want attention. We'll just put it that way. Countries have tried the socialist experiment time and time again. This has failed. Doctors in Cuba moonlight as taxi drivers. Countries with socialized health care haven't fared much better than the U.S. in their handling of the coronavirus. And any I mean, what's wrong with being a taxi driver? I, I drove for Uber and Lyft for a number of years, and, and I it's a it's a great system just because they happen to moonlight as taxi drivers doesn't mean that one they have to maybe maybe they feel the need to maybe there is a need for for more taxi drivers um and by all accounts anyone that that, that i haven't myself but anyone that i've seen who has studied the cuba uh the cuban system would say that for the average person the the health outcomes are much better than in the u.s so that's not that's not really a strong argument in my opinion any socialist regime will never First of all, socialist healthcare systems provide provision of healthcare. Public health policy and random mutations of a virus have nothing to do with the with the type of economic distribution you have. Now, if you actually look at the countries that have best responded to coronavirus, they have been left-wing countries. Vietnam, New Zealand under uh, the Labour Party, under uh, Jacinda Ardern, the most left-wing prime minister they've had in decades. China had the most effective lockdowns in the world before we even had any kind of treatment or any kind of understanding of the coronavirus's transmissibility. China, with the origin of the virus, handled it, or at least we believe, the most effectively. What is he talking about? And see, this is what I was talking about earlier. When, when Mike is talking about political policy and, and analyzing the, the way the world is actually working on the ground, he's really good. Like, he has a lot of examples. He, he obviously has a lot of knowledge. It's just when he veers off into these personal attacks and, the, and I don't want to say clout-chasing endeavors, but, but definitely uh, deciding to, to stir up a lot of, of stuff with a, with a bunch of different leftists, especially lately, that's when he's... I would say ineffective and and divisive to to the left wing movement in you know online really, so so that affects the the entire left wing world, I would say. So I, I wish you would stick to to more stuff like this and and just it, it's not going to profit anyone to just appear to be uh, clout chasing. It's not going to profit anyone to appear to just have a personal beef and come up with all these excuses to, to pull up old stuff that's already been dealt with um, to to try and, and smear them with. You're just going to look like, you know, it's your personal beef at best and, and at worst, like some kind of grifter who's just trying to uh, divide the left and at your, your own profit and the expense of everyone else. It was the right-wing countries of Brazil and the United States that suffered the most mightily. And now it looks like India under Modi, another fascist right winger have done bad. He's not even right on this. Cuba did really good on Corona as well. Don't forget Cuba is the only country in Latin America that developed the COVID-19 vaccine. Like if there's anything about the Cuban system that they get right, it's the healthcare system. They have so many more doctors and they, pr they have such a higher life expectancy that similarly situated countries they're actually providing doctors and training all over the world constantly as a country that is has been under sanction of the United States for over 60 years. Economic yeah. sanction. And that that's that's worth highlighting as well for, for a country that has been forced to be basically as self-sufficient as as any nation of that size can possibly be. They've done amazingly well to not have completely collapsed. 
Uh, they, they've instituted all kinds of, of urban farming systems. I mean, throughout the throughout the country. Um, so, whatever you say about their, their particular government and, and your feelings about it, their outcomes have been pretty good considering all that they've been subjected to. This is primarily by the U.S. So, uh, Mike is one of the smartest uh, reformists I know. I, I would agree with that. You know, I, I haven't been following him for, for all that long, but uh, in maybe the five or six months that I have been, I, I definitely have been impressed when he's, when he's talking about policy and, and real ideas and stuff like that. So, I mean, that's what attracted me to his channel in the first place. That's the only reason that I even uh, bothered to spend the time with, with uh, his Twitch stream and stuff like that. So... To the world superpower and largest market 60 miles offshore, they're sanctioned. And they still... Oh, thank you very much for the cheer, Alyosha. I'm, I'm not yet an affiliate, so I don't know if I can accept actual cheers, or, or I'm not quite sure if you were uh, just cheering in general. But anyway, I appreciate the support, friend. And I really like your, your content a lot. I, I was on your stream uh, hanging out after my last stream on Friday, and uh, it was some really good stuff. I really, uh, you've really developed a, a very uh, kind and, and uh, caring community there, so you should be proud of that as well. Everyone go follow Ali Osher as well. I don't know if I can even do shout-outs. I never even tried to do that before, so maybe we'll give that a try right now. Uh, let's see if I even have that command. Let's see if it does it. No, I don't, I don't think I've even set that up yet. But anyway, go follow Ali Osher. Top tier leftist content. Really smart guy. Really, uh, really an asset. Have remained. What well, Cuba is a terrible example. Necessarily involved the bureaucracy of Washington even more heavily in our economy. Any country that has attempted to realize a- Bureaucracy of Washington? Is he a conservative? These are conservative dog whistles. Bureaucracy of Washington. Joe Biden is pushing for a lot more regulation. Even he is. What? The socialist economy has either failed completely, such as in the case of the USSR, destroyed large swaths of their- The USSR fell because of a political crisis, not- So you're saying Mike has some, some bad takes on social issues? I mean, <laughs> can you think of any streamers that don't? Maybe one or two, but I'm sure there's other people that that would disagree with you. I mean, I, I think we have we can't really be. I mean, as a left movement, especially in the United States, that's 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 pretty new for the most part, and pretty small, uh, no matter how you look at it. I think I don't think we can be too picky about who we choose as allies, as as long as they want to get past communism, and they don't want to go in some weird ass right wing direction. Uh, I think they should probably be counted as allies and we should we should uplift the good as much as we can and, you know, call them, still call them out when they do bad things. But but maybe more so turn towards more of a strategy of calling in, you know. So that's just my take, though. Not an economic crisis. Some of it had to do with the economic catastrophe that was the Chernobyl accident. But like the CIA at the time, didn't think the Soviet Union was about to collapse because it wasn't an economic collapse, it was a political collapse. What kind of retconning is this? It's not even historically true. What the fuck is he talking about? And Russia went from having the eighth or ninth. You say you're a, a platformist. Um, I'd be curious to know what you mean by that. Do you mean that you, you, you like to platform people when they do good stuff? Am I, am I reading that correctly? Linky arty? Ninth largest economy in the world before the revolution to the second largest economy in the world. And they and the USSR was not passed until the 90s by Japan. What the hell are you talking about? And, and Russia's population is not large. Their economy, such as in Venezuela, or have been forced to embrace more neoliberal economic policies to realize true growth in their economy, such as in China or Vietnam. Liberal China and Vietnam are doing neoliberalism. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's not, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, again, I think, I think probably if you're being uncharitable, um, and I might even agree with it, you, you could say that, that countries such as, as China and Vietnam 
are more towards the the state capitalist side of things. But to say neoliberal, I very much disagree with because one component of neoliberalism it it they may not tout it, but it definitely is an, uh, you know something that they can't do without is uh, imperialism and enforcing unfair trade negotiations with with much smaller and, and weaker politically anyway countries. So I, I, I would say by all accounts, China is not doing that. Where they are moving into places like Africa, they are instead, you know, they're at least offering more fair deals to the, the local governments than the U.S. or uh, the U.K. or any other, you know, much more imperial country is. So I, I would disagree that they are neoliberal in any way. Policies work better in both theory and practice when it comes to efficiently allocating... Ah, huh, so platforming. Oh, and by the way, you're very welcome, Alios. I really do love your comment, your content, and I'm glad I found you through uh, I Dan Simpson, who is another person you should all check out. I Dan Simpson, uh, very good at, at platforming leftists and um, doing good faith content and just kind of working through things um, without creating all the drama that you find in a lot of other cham- channels. So go check him out as well. Uh, so platforming is a term of anarchism that only seeks to organize with revolutionaries who fully agree with uh, the movement's ideas. I, I, I mean, to some extent, you have to be that way. You can't have people that are going to try and undermine you um, politically to, to one extent or another uh, in terms of, like, say, getting past, so, getting past capitalism, that is to say. Uh, but I don't, I don't know that we can be real picky about our allies at this point, uh, maybe in the future, once once uh, either capitalism has failed or something has replaced it uh, through outcompeting it or, or whatever means that it does by creating parallel, power, uh, parallel systems of power and um, care, really, uh, like mutual aid systems. Uh, perhaps at that point, when, when capitalism is... is weak and, and either is about to fail or does fail, then we can get into, you know, sussing out what the, the absolute best way to move forward is and, and new allyships will form at that point. But I think at this point, you know, as long as people are moving past capitalism, I'm happy with that. Um, I, I, my particular beliefs are more towards anarchism. Uh, myself, I, I like the, the empowering feeling and, and the, the kind of bottom-up approach that they have. And I, I also like the idea that Kropotkin uh, likes to put out, especially in the Conquest of Bread, of, of investing the revolution in the revolutionaries. You know, that the revolution is not the overthrow of the dominant power system, but rather uh, providing the, the prom- uh, fulfilling the promises of the revolution. So, you, know, you, you say you're going to provide bread for all or housing or, or all these basic needs for everyone. Well, that better be priority number one uh, once the other system is, is weak enough that it can be pushed out of the way. Um, so I, I like that sort of system. I, I, I see a lot of merit and potential in that. But uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just at this point, I'm happy that anyone is, is at least dreaming beyond capitalism and, and working in any way to, to get beyond its grasp. I, I think that's... Uh, that's pretty great. So I would count anyone who is as an ally, pretty much. ...resources to maximizing the economic productivity of any country, and we've seen this play out time and time again across a wide variety of markets and countries throughout history across... Not true at all. The fastest growing economies in world history was the USSR and China. And then I think it was South Korea under the five-year plans of their military junta, which used a kind of... that used basically central planning... Now, they were right-wingers and did call themselves socialists, but it was a planned development. It was not free markets. And then, you know, if you look at the country that's grown the fastest in the last 20 years in South America, it was Bolivia under the uh, Evo Morales and the movement towards socialism. This is not even accurate. Like, what is he? What? Oftentimes, people like Richard Wolff will bring up the boom-bust cycle as though it's an inherent flaw of capitalism. But I believe I speak... I can't see how it would be an inherent virtue or, or, or a thing to shoot for. Uh, the the more unregulated capitalism is, the the more, I guess, uh, free for all it is. Where you get to the point of of more like an Ayn Rand sort of system, where the only law left is is contract law, and uh, 
and labor, uh, yeah, including labor contracts and also interbusiness contracts. Um, once you get to that point, uh, the boom bust cycle is just enormous. You know, when, back when there was no, say, child regulations or regulations about child labor, it was boom bust all the time. Uh, so, I mean, not only logically, but but in actual practice, the the more you provide for people, the more of a of a safety net you provide, the the more things even out. They, there's much less boom bust, and and China's certainly shown that they've bounced back very quickly from the the coronavirus, and as as many would say, they're not even at the point of socialism yet either. So, but even just having that that central command and control. Uh, sort of a system really makes you a lot more resilient to these shocks that that the U.S. is not. Like we came, well, we've come pretty close to uh, the entire economy collapsing from the sort of uh, shock to the system. So, for most, when I say that a boom bust cycle is preferable to just going bust, as so many socialist countries have. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a witty turn of phrase, but you know. There's a lot more. For one thing, there's a lot more at play for for all those left wing movements that have have gone bust, uh, so to speak. There's always been pressure from uh, capitalist countries, especially like the UK and the United States. Uh, whether that's just internal meddling, like uh, uh, working towards regime change, or whether it's outright invasion, uh, like they did to the Soviet Union right after World War One. They, they, you know, they don't teach that much in history class, but uh, a coalition of, of uh, the United States and UK and uh, I'm not sure which other countries, they actually went and invaded the USSR just as it was is really getting going. Um, and, th- and this has been the case throughout, especially the US's history of just sabotaging in any way possible any sort of left wing movement. Uh, and I, I, I would say you know, more so than, than looking towards some sort of uh, theory of, of, of it, the country just being evil, I think it's more reasonable to assume that it's just because socialism is competition, and so they're going to eliminate competition any way they want, because they want to keep things basically as they are. Uh, that's why you see the, the crackdown on left-wing movements much more hard, um, even within the U.S., you know, look at the way the capital riders were, were especially at the beginning, treated with, with a lot of deference and, and leeway, even though they beat a cop to death um, and other people died as a result of their activities as well. And even though they were uh, literally disrupting the, the heart of, of U.S. government at the federal level, supposed to be the highest uh, part of the government in the land, uh, you know, they, they, they were treated with much more deference and, and care than the Black Lives Matter protesters who had been there just the summer before. And, and you see this again and again and again to the point where you have things like the Red Scare. There was, there was no uh, comparable um, Red Scare of uh, any sort of uh, fascist ideology People, I mean, aside from uh, a little bit of the FBI infiltrating the KKK, there hasn't been a whole lot of government repression of right-wing movements in the United States because they want to keep things basically as they are and retain the power where it's at. Uh, wasn't Trotsky still commander of the Red Army then? I, You know, I actual history of, of places like the Soviet Union is, is something that I personally need to um, get more into myself. I, I've been working more towards just the, the basic theories at this point, which is you know, why I'm called bread theory. It's, it's uh, not just that I know all this theory, it's, it's that I, I'm going through it with you. That, that's the, the point of the, the channel when I, when I stream on Fridays, we go through theory books. Um, so Definitely, at some point, I'll get more into the histories. But right now, I'm just I'm just focusing on, uh, you know, the bread and butter. Why do we believe this sort of thing, uh, and and maybe some case studies of of how it went here and there, that sort of thing. So I can't really speak to Trotsky at this point because I haven't really studied him yet.
It's also important for us to realize that no economic organization is in and of itself inherently moral or immoral, but rather we ought to view them as tools to effect some greater output for our country that we can later utilize and distribute in the most fair manner with government policy. Fair is a yeah, oh, Mike's going to say the same thing, but fair is a, is a value judgment. You can't really divorce that at all from morality. So he's already making an incoherent statement in his opening remarks. A moral judgment. Fair, he said it. we should use it as moral, and then he said the word fair. I, I am only vaguely familiar with the Black Army. Um, uh, they were they were basically the, the right-wing uh, counter force or counter-revolutionary force, if I'm not mistaken, to the Red Army. Um, and you say Macno was pretty cool. Uh, that's another figure not quite familiar with yet either, but, you know. Always, always good roads to, to or, or good paths to, to follow later on. So thank you for that. Does he not know what fair is? It's a value judgment. I mean, if you're going to argue and morality shouldn't uh, affect economics, you shouldn't then go, well, most fair. Determining what is fair is morality. I mean, I hate to make such a pedantic point, but this is your opening statement. You prepared this. See, to most of our citizens as we... As also, I'm sure that Destiny would object to... Oh, the Black Army was anarchist. Well, I, maybe I'm thinking of the, the Black Hundreds or something like that. Anarchist communist. Okay, then I'm not at all familiar with the Black Army then, I'll have to say. Uh, but that does sound interesting because anarcho-communism is, is tends to be where I'm at these days. Um, so yeah, definitely like to learn more about that. Very cool. Um, but anyway, so I, w I would bet you that, that Destiny would argue that if we were talking about some other forms of economy, such as like slave and master, uh, that fairness and morality would definitely come into the picture. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I, I, I would say that using the, 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 the labor of other people literally as if they are uh, machinery to be moved about is, is one of the most um, efficient ways of doing things. It's just incredibly brutal and, and, dehumanizing and wrong um so the idea that 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 morality doesn't shouldn't come into play when we're talking about what economic system will follow that just that doesn't doesn't make any sense at all i mean what affects the the uh state of a a society more so than the economy why would we just leave morality and, and fairness? Well, I guess we're not leaving fairness, but somehow leaving morality at the door just because we're talking about the economy. I don't see what, what's so sacred about economics that, that we need to uh, just view it as a cold, dead tool that, that has no inherent fairness or unfairness. I mean, a pyramid system is inherently unfair. Uh, it's going to, to value the people at the top the most. It's going to compensate them the most. And it's going to protect them the most if, if times get tough. And, and there's just no two ways about it. That's just the way this structure is built. It's, it's built in an inherently uh, unfair manner. So kind of bizarre. We see fit, creating a bigger a bigger pie, so to speak, from which all of us can eat. Morality and justice should exist in the realm of government policy. We cannot allow it to blind us to the economic. Government policy is economic policy. Our economic system is determined by government policy, which you just said when you said that Venezuela failed because of the government policy on the economy, because they're intertwined. Why this? Even though it, it also failed in large part because the government policy of the United States. Um putting putting various embargoes on its its number one export which was oil and petroleum and products so that's kind of it's, it, he's not he's not making very much of a coherent opening statement here in my opinion this is like this is undergrad level fuck ups reality surrounding us no matter how much we wish a wild lion not to eat us our desire alone will never satiate its appetite while socialism may sound good in theory the destruction i don't even know what that's supposed to mean in relation to what he's talking about i mean is he just alluding to people are inherently greedy and self-serving because that's not that may be his worldview i wouldn't actually be surprised i i get the the, the feeling from 
what what I have seen of Destiny that uh, he struggles in the the empathy department, um, and he also tends to believe in. I, I would I would imagine, in things like natural hierarchy hierarchies, and uh, great men of history and that sort of thing. Um, so. I guess I guess it wouldn't surprise me to to learn that he actually did believe that the the world is is nasty and brutish, uh, by its nature, but that kind of flies in the face of of you know, all of human achievement because it's all been collaborative, um, even if it's not directly, even if it's back through the generations, just building knowledge upon knowledge, and technology upon technology, it's all been collaborative in one way or another, um, and. They don't get into it in this debate, but capitalism stands in the way of all of that through things like patent law and and hoarding of of knowledge, um, keeping it away just for economic gain for the few. It would rot on the wealth of our country. These and the pretension analogies. Our businesses would not help the vast majority of Americans. It would be foolish to enforce protectionist or socialist policies on our economy while major developing economies, such as India and China, are moving in the exact opposite direction. China, first of all, China did extensively protectionist policies and they still have protectionist policies to this day. You as a foreigner cannot own a business in China. You have to be a minority partner. You as a foreign born person cannot gain Chinese citizenship. They are extremely protectionist. This is like basic fact level knowledge law. Like what? How do you not know this? Having realized time and time again, the failures in socialist planning. Socialism implies two major things, a change in both the means and mode of production. The means of production change in such a way to completely disallow private investment or ownership, and a change in the mode of production such See, it, does, it does not allow, it does not disallow private investment necessarily. You can, you can still have a market where, and, and Wolf brings this up later on, you can have a system where you can invest in worker-owned cooperatives, you just don't get a controlling share. There's, there's, there's no, you know incompatibility with that that we no longer produce goods and services for a profit instead businesses are only started the and, and and you can still produce goods and services for the profit of the whole it's just that the worker owned cooperative then gets to decide where that profit goes what's going to be invested what's going to go back to um the the owners what's going to be set aside for a rainy day so on and so forth um, so what's, again, is it's not incompatible. He's, he's, I mean, he's conflating socialism with, with, I would say communism, like, uh, where you have a centrally planned economy completely, the, 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 the central planning just completely takes over. You, you do away with things like, uh, money and you just distribute things based, based more on need. Um, but even still, that doesn't stop people from producing everything that they need either so it's just it's just strange the way he's phrasing all this stuff approval of some governmental body some kind of central planning with the equal decision making and management of every worker and the goods and services produced in any okay, central planning is a tool that it can exist in any form of government it doesn't necessarily right i mean you saw massive amounts of central planning happening within the united states during the coronavirus that like the stimulus checks that's that's the that's the government deciding on its own without any sort of vote from the people uh, that it's going to print a bunch of money, basically, and distribute it out to the people because otherwise the economy collapses. You saw central planning when the housing bubble burst and uh, a lot of the, the car manufacturers had to be nationalized for, for a time period. Like They just came in and, and did it, and then they just came in and, and centrally planned the bailout. So... I mean, we're supposed to be the number one capitalist country in the entire world, and yet we still do central planning. We do a lot of central planning. We even, I mean, like I'm trained in, in urban planning, and, and even that is a form of central planning. Even things like zoning, deciding what can go where in your, your town uh, is a form of central planning. So it's kind of bizarre mean socialist you could have a centrally planned economy with a fascist government that's not socialism that's just central True. planning the united states did central planning during world war ii did he not know that a lot. oh yeah but you know buy war bonds uh grow victory gardens huge 
propaganda campaigns. I don't mean propaganda in any sort of necessarily negative or pernicious way, just like propagating the idea that, that, you know, we all have to contribute to this, this war effort, you know, however you feel about that, uh, after the fact, but, but, but still lots of, of central planning stuff. They rationed things. Uh, they especially rationed things in, in countries such as the UK that were, uh, more or less under siege by the Nazis. But the United States did central planning in World War II. Uh, are we... Is this real life? <laughs> ...society are what some government body dictates irrespective of market forces or the wants and desires of the citizens. It's likely in the course of this debate that my opponent will suggest... Wait, the wants and desires of the citizens are not being felt right now because for the part of your day that occupies most of your time, most likely, and the part of your... Uh, daily efforts that that uh you depend most on for survival you get very little say probably virtually no say other than once in a while being maybe being able to call out sick if you need to or just decide to um, maybe once in a while you get a vacation and but i mean still you you don't get final say in any of that stuff um you definitely don't get to say get much of a say in how much you're compensated, you can negotiate, but your employer holds all the cards when it comes down to it, because they can just say no, uh, if you don't like it, leave. Um, so the idea of, of somehow central planning going against the wishes of the people, more so than uh, top-down um, capitalist systems, that just doesn't make any sense to me we take after Nordic or Western European countries, setting that things like socialized healthcare or subsidized education are powerful programs. Why do you think it's called socialized healthcare? <laughs> many of the underserved needs of Americans today. While this is true, I would like to remind everyone that we've spent the last decade reminding conservatives that the government simply providing welfare has absolutely nothing to do with socialism. My opponent believes that strong social safety nets and welfare- Okay, okay but that, that is the government making value judgments and intervening in ways that affect the market, is it not? That is central planning, is it not? Okay, that is not... Okay. The government doing things is not socialism, necessarily. Right. But the movements that got the political conditions required to have the government do things were socialist movements. Absolutely. You know, we just celebrated May Day on uh, Saturday, and, and that commemorates uh, the, the, I don't even know uh, a good way of putting it, but basically what's commonly referred to as the, the Haymarket riots, where a bunch of anarchists were framed for literal bomb throwing at the police. Um, and uh, I think they went to trial. I, I don't remember if they were executed or not, but they definitely weren't free again after that point. But it was because they were... Uh, pushing for things like the eight hour work day and uh, the 40 hour work week and, and, and stuff like that, that, that they were targeted. Um, but they did win those battles to a certain degree anyway. Um, so yeah, it was, it was in spite of capitalism. It definitely was not because of capitalism that we have such protections today. It's they were trying to decommodify things, take them away from profit-making institutions and firms in the economy, and have them provide these services socially, and allocate resources not due to market demands, but social and political demands. And the and the groups and organizations that did that, that accomplished that in Nordic countries, were socialist movements and socialist parties arguing against capitalism and market logic Right. These were, these were the socialists that took the reformist route rather than the revolutionary route. And, you know, say what you will about the their strategy. It has produced at least some results, uh, whereas in those same countries, revolutionary strategies have not as much produced results. So I mean, it's at least something to consider. Not that I necessarily believe that we can ever reform our way out of capitalism, but we can at least reform things to set the stage for getting past capitalism. That's something I believe. 
and instead in favor of the public provision of needed and necessary services. And the outcome has been incredibly positive and proven that markets are actually not the most efficient way to provide and plan the distribution of resources in an economy. So are Nordic countries fully socialist? No. no. But are the Nordic policies that people point to the result of socialist or capitalist politics? The answer is socialist politics. Sure. They were policies proposed by people like Professor Wolf in social democratic parties and socialist parties. And I don't know if you know this, but social democracy, let's go to the Wikipedia page. God, this is cringe. But I think if we go to Wik Wikipedia, maybe uh, someone just edited this. <laughs> okay, okay, so it got edited back. Somebody tried to edit this. Someone tried to edit this, and it got reverted. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I mean, you gotta wonder if, if Destiny's uh, followers were, were actually behind trying to do these sorts of things on the fly to make him look better, in case they went to definitions at some point. And Destiny's still trying to edit it! Social democracy is a political, social, and economic philosophy within socialism. Basically, it's reformist socialism. The yeah. idea that you could use reformist. liberal, democratic institutions to enact socialism over time, gradually, as well as the reformist wing of democratic socialism. Yeah, although it, it, it supposedly is, is more muscular than it is in the U.S. anyway where it, it is, uh, you make a, a political party, like a socialist party or a communist party, and you are overtly leftist in your beliefs, but then you work within the, the current um, democratic framework to win elections and, and push as much as you possibly can. So we don't exactly have that in the U.S. We don't have any form of... of you know, socialist party that has any, that has won any seats in any major elections. Um, but in other countries, it, it has worked better. So there, there are a lot of other countries that actually have true leftist parties that, that, that still try to reform within the system. So. Yeah. Listen. I don't think social demo democratic policies that are proposed, like, for example, if you had enacted all of Bernie Sanders policies... That would be social democratic policies, and you, we wouldn't be in socialism. But does that mean Bernie Sanders is not a socialist? No, because we wouldn't stop there. These are transitional policies toward a social framework. We're trying to transition from this strict capitalist framework to another one. I mean, this okay, is just point pedantic point. bullshit, but like, it's pathetic. Most liberals who welcome him with open arms, me included. And there's definitely something to be said for especially in this day and age when when uh, these large world powers have so much power that that any sort of like head on revolution would never have any chance of of winning. Um, like e even looking at I mean, you can see that playing out in even the uh, the uh, the attempted coup in in. Uh, that, that just happened with uh, Trump supporters. There was, there was no chance that they were actually going to take over the government. I mean, they definitely could have hurt a lot of people. They definitely could have even killed some, some key figures in politics, but that would not have brought down the entire government by any means. They would not have just been able to occupy the capital. I mean, they weren't prepared for anything like that. I, I think they were, many of them, very surprised they even got through the gates. But it seems to be that there was people working on their side from within. But anyway, uh, there was no chance that the entire United States government was going to fall from a bunch of largely unarmed, flag-waving Trump supporters. Um, and any sort of armed revolution wouldn't stand a chance against the U.S. military or even, say, a local National Guard unit. Like, there's just no way. <laughs> uh, so... Reform does seem like an enticing alternative. Um, what I would prefer even B 
beyond reform. And not, not to say that we can't do a multitude of tactics all at once, but, but my preference is more just uh, sort of a, a, I would say, a direct action form of organizing where you just slowly build power within your own area to meet the needs of the people that are not being met by, by even local governments at this point. So coming together to, uh, you know, provide food for one another, um, coming together to say, buy the apartment building that you occupy along with, uh, everyone else who's current residents and turn it into a housing cooperative. So you have more equity in, in the, uh, um, in the in the uh, uh, building itself, you're, you're actually putting equity that that you can then take out rather than paying someone else's mortgage. Um, I think these systems have a a, a better chance of uh, producing real change for people, and at the same time, it it shows the inadequacy of of the current systems to address these sorts of problems. Or more so than the inadequacy, I would I'd actually rather say the unwillingness to address things like homelessness and f- food insecurity and, and those sorts of things. They just don't care enough because those people tend not to be very politically strong. So, I mean, they can afford not to care. Um, but anyway, a little bit of a digression. Consequentially, there are five major hurdles. That no, they so- wouldn't. You called Medicare for all the fifth Reich of health care. Socialist I have ever mm. spoken to is adequately addressed, an and they are as follows. Number one, what level of violence is acceptable for you to reach our socialist state? Number two, how do we decide which businesses are allowed to exist in a socialist Okay. What I wish Wolf would have come back with when he said what level of violence is acceptable to reach our socialist state, what I wish he would have said is what level of violence is acceptable to maintain our capitalist state of things? Because just because you don't see the violence, just because you maybe don't experience it firsthand or even on TV, doesn't mean it's not happening and not a necessary part of propping up capitalism. Because it definitely is. We've, we've supported all sorts of right-wing death squads and, and, and uh, paramilitary governments around the world in the name of, of keeping you know, capitalism on top as a world economic system. Uh, we continue to do things like, uh, you know, say just polluting areas of the country that are, are, are less well-to-do. Um, environmental racism is, is a product of the capitalist form of, of putting profit above everything um, and putting all of the, the consequences onto the people at large while you get all the, the benefits as the owner. And, and can afford to stay away in the nicer parts of, of whatever part of the country you happen to live in. You don't have to deal with, you know, polluted water like the poor residents of, of Flint, I believe, still have to do. Uh, or the people that are in fracked country. You know, you don't have to deal with the consequences of, of your operation. So what level of violence is acceptable to maintain that? So, so, I mean, the answer then would be what level of violence is acceptable to enact socialism is less than what we're doing right now. Less than all the wars that we go to just to prove that uh, we are still the economic and, and political power in the world. Less than all the proxy wars that we fight against rival sorts of uh, economic systems. Um, that would have been a good way to, to take it, but, you know... I guess, I guess it just got breezed by and, and Wolf focused on other things. Society without What is the acceptable level of violence to maintain the status quo? Uh, this is a stupid Mike fucking argument. I, I forgot private he capital said investment. That. Three, is any form of investment whatsoever allowed in a socialist society for an expansion of business? Of course it is. There's, there's no incongruity with that. You, I mean, you can even go to the bank and, and get a loan as, as a worker cooperative. There's, there's nothing stopping you. Nothing stopping you from going to... Uh, a, a credit union to do the same thing, which, which itself is a much more democratic form of banking. Four, how are labor markets determined in a socialist society? And five, how do we calculate which goods and services a nation needs if we do away with the commodity form? 
I mean, we produce all sorts of stuff that people don't need right now. Um, you calculate need by people saying they have a need for one thing or another by saying, hey, we have a surplus of, of coats that we've manufactured, so we're going to find out who needs coats and we're going to distribute them as best we can through whatever networks are available. And in return, we're going to expect that if we go to the grocery store, we can uh, pick out as much food as we need to get all the nutrition that we need. You know, people, do, people are pretty good at determining what their own needs are when it comes to, at, at least when it comes to the basics of survival. Um, and then beyond that point, just through finding out what, what, what is still being uh, manufactured in surplus and, and uh, connecting up people that need it with people that, that are making it. So, I mean, there's no, there's no real problem in that. He's making a problem where there really would be none. Those are my five. Cool. Wait, right, so he so literally just asked five questions. He's just trying to ask questions. All right, well, then you're going to get a lecture. I hope he doesn't <laughs> complain about getting... That, that was very impressive. Mike had not... I, th I think he was watching this live when he made this video. So, yeah, he did get a lecture because that's what he kept pushing him into. And, and Destiny spent the entire back and forth pretty much just asking questions so i don't know why he was so surprised when what he got back were answers that took longer than his question took to ask uh, he he complained oh i didn't get enough time oh he's you know steamrolled me with all his talking and stuff like that but i mean one thing wolf talks a lot slower destiny is is a spitfire um and for another thing because he was answering the questions like he didn't spend a whole lot of time even getting to ask Destiny anything because he had to spend it explaining to him these these very basic principles that he believed in. Getting a lecture. I guess begin uh, now. Where do you want to start? Can I respond to what was said? Yeah, of course. Yeah, whatever you want to do, yeah. Okay. Um, I find this a laughable caricature of anything I've ever written or anything that I understand uh, is part of this conversation. And I don't appreciate being told what I think or what I say or what I mean or what I intend. I can speak for myself and that would just be fine if we could allow each other to. I mean, this is something Destiny does. He does straw man so hard. So it is great to see Professor Wolf having the same reaction that I did to talking to this fucking cretin. To do that, number one. Number two. I have no idea what this uh, silly remark that I hear so often is that no so socialist society has succeeded at anything. I have no idea what you're talking about. Let me give you an example. One of the most important oh, metrics used in the economics the profession around... And uh, beyond, I mean, he's going to bring up the Mondragon Corporation quite a bit. But beyond that, I, I wish he had really uh, brought up some some current... Um, systems that are much more democratic, such as the democratic confederalism of um, the Rojava part of Syria, uh, as, as well as the Zapatista movement in, in Mexico, because there's some pretty concrete, and, and especially when you talk about the Zapatistas, some pretty large scale uh, societies of people that, that operate within um, I mean, physically within, not not politically. They they they're very much not intertwined with the the larger um, political states that they are within. Like uh, Zapatistas are, are pretty much in a, a large autonomous zone, and they they focus a lot of their time on on having small municipal meetings um, that they then take their their uh, representatives go then to larger meetings. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure about all the details, but basically, in, in both these cases, these are, these are uh, successful and now pretty long-running uh, versions of, I would say, I would say they, they qualify as socialism in terms of uh, the amount of buy-in and, and control that people actually have over uh, their government and, and their destinies, really. Around the world to assess the quote-unquote success of an economic system is the rate of economic growth. You measure GDP and you look at how it grows over time. 
And then you compare one country to another to assess their relative success, not as societies, because that's a vague generality, but at this particular metric, which we use in economics to measure economic growth over time. It's not the only metric, but it's a widely used one. So I'm now going to use it. In the 20th century, the fastest growing metric, the fastest growing GDP in any country measured was the Soviet Union. And in the 21st century we're living in, the fastest growing GDP in the world has been the People's Republic of China. This is not an endorsement of one or another economic system. It's a statement of fact verified by any reliable source of information. The UN, the projects in the University of California, Berkeley, and others who keep track of this. What I said so earlier, This Chad. has so to be understood Easy. because in much of the world, economic growth is a shared objective and goal that these two societies have excelled at achieving. Number one. Number two, when it comes to socialism, it would be useful if we all understood what the word means rather than playing around with caricatures. For example, the notion that socialism is all about what the government does has been contested throughout the history of socialism. And, and this is what I was trying to bring up before, that even though he's throwing this out as as one, I mean, not even that, that government doing things, but, but uh, like a, a state-controlled form of socialism, even though he's throwing that out as a potential definition, he, he doesn't end up saying that that's the one that he particularly agrees with. He's just trying to give the whole history of it because he's a professor and that's what he does. And that idea is less dominant within the socialist tradition now than it ever was over the last 150 years. For example, today, one of the most important issues for socialists has to do not with government regulation, not with government owning and operating businesses, not with these bugaboos of bureaucracy and all the rest of it, but has to do with an objective of transforming the organization of production in a factory, in an office, in a store, not to have a small group of people, the owner, the board of directors, the tiny little minority at the top that is a dictatorial power inside an enterprise, making all the key decisions that the employees have to live with, even though the minority making those decisions is not accountable to those employees. And he's really good at, at laying out just how anti-democratic the modern day workplace is for, for anyone who has, uh, who, who works under a capitalist organizational uh, framework. Uh, it's something that people probably don't think about all that much, really. I mean, I know I didn't think about it much before I got into these sorts of ideas. It just is taken as a matter of course. You know, it, it's, it's like, uh, it's like if you were to try to tell a fish that it's, it's living in water, it would take a long time for it to really understand that, assuming it could understand your speech at all. But, but something that you were immersed in, that you've, you've grown up in, uh, it's hard to really see because it, it's hard to separate it from anything else because you don't know even what it's possible to separate it from. Uh, so I, I, I like the way that he, he puts the problem right out there at the front as... Capitalism is just top-down authoritarian organ authoritarian organization, where the the owner at the top uh, gets to call all the shots, and uh, everyone else just pretty much has to do their bidding or find a different master to work under. Employees, that's a socialism of transformation at the micro level, about which very little could have been discerned in the comments preceding these. If we're going to talk about socialism, then we have to talk about what it means to the people pushing for it and urging it. And those people have learned from the 20th and 21st century 
just like those who pushed for capitalism three centuries ago learned from their early experiments how to refine, how to adjust, and how to change. To pretend that that didn't happen, to trade in old and shrinking conceptions of socialism may be good debating ploy, but it doesn't advance our understanding of anything. Um, okay. If you want, it'd be easier to have a more of a back and forth rather than uh, the super long uh, monologue, so we can respond to each other. What? That wasn't even long. It really wasn't. I thought he was. was I thought that statement. Wolf was gonna go and that. That was like totally. Comp that was like a couple paragraphs. What? He's complaining right off the bat. Dude asks five questions. Someone takes five minutes to answer. You took more than a minute to answer my questions. People like this guy. <laughs> The more, if you're okay with that, um, just for for a couple of things that you said. So, uh, I'm trying I just, not to miss. I just oh, talk slower than you. Oh yeah, no, it's fine, it's fine. Um, <clears throat> my understanding is that um, in the 20th century there was a faster growing economy than the USSR, and it was Japan. Absolutely. Japan still Somehow exists today, and the USSR does not. I understand that the USSR did show a huge amount of growth, but I think it's odd to use that as an example when socialists often point to the evils of imperialism um, and when you point out the fact that everybody was heavily industrializing around that time as well. I don't think it's fair to say that the USSR simply grew on the merits of so. So that cuts both ways. If you can't say that the USSR just grew of its, of its own merits as, as a socialist country, you also couldn't say that the US and, and, and other Western countries didn't also just happen to grow because everything was rapidly industrializing. I mean, it, it cuts both ways. It, that's, not a, that's not a real argument. Socialism, uh, when there were so many other things happening at the time, and when it was outgrown okay, by- Okay, so wait a minute. We point to capitalists growing fast due to industrialization and say that's a virtue of capitalism, but if the same growth but yeah. faster happens in socialist states, it's not a virtue of socialism? No. That seems like an ad hoc way of looking at things, almost it's like you have to, biased reasoning. Yeah. Another economy that but was- those are, the, those are the facts. I mean, I, you can play whatever games you want. The fact of the matter is that the Soviet Union's performance in the 20th century completely outshines that of Japan. There's no comparison. In 1917, when the Soviet Union begins, it is the poorest country in Europe. All right, I don't have that much longer to stream tonight. I have work in the morning, so uh, I'm probably going to wrap it up by 9 o'clock here. So I'm going to probably go through uh, a larger chunk without having too much com commentary on it myself. Europe, by far. It then goes through 70 years of a lost world war one of a civil war of an agricultural collectivization and of world war ii which did more damage in russia than in any other country none notwithstanding that it was the poorest country at the beginning of this horrific story it ends up in 1965 being the number one competitor of the united states for global hegemony that's only because of its number one status in economic growth that achieved the overcoming of all those horrific losses. I'm not arguing in favor of this or that about the Soviet Union, but the fact of its achievement is a staggering reality that you can dance around from here to tomorrow, but it doesn't go away because it's inconvenient to confront it. And the same thing is true now. If you read Pearl Buck's novels about China before the revolution, you will hear about a society Thank you. I whose saw this. depth I saw the of poverty literally blows your mind. And here they are about to surpass the United States before the end of this decade. And that was accomplished by a communist revolution and a government that has been run by a communist party to this day. And yeah. For sure, they cleverly opened their society up to capitalists to come and join them. But to imagine that the achievement of the Chinese uh, economy is purely due to the private capitalists rather than to the state economy 
That's making believe because you need to have an argument that puts the success at the credit of one or the other, the infrastructure, the training of the mass of people. Everything that happened in China is as much a product of the planning and policies of the communist government than of any other factor. And that has to be recognized as well. I think that's a pretty good rebuttal, really. Like, like he took everything that Destiny said. He uh, processed it and, and gave a, a statement back that you, you can't just chalk it all up to the rapid industrialization of the rest of the world. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure that Destiny doesn't have anything of substance really to say to that. I think he just pivots on to, to something different. And none of this is an endorsement. That society has strengths and weaknesses. It has things we can criticize. But we can't make it up because it's inconvenient to face. So this is what's known as nuance. Some people have hard time with this part of the brain. Mm -hmm. The nuance part of like, ah, there's ambiguities and there's and not everything's black and white. And oh, that's difficult for a lot of people's brains, especially people that are egomaniacs. Why doesn't D go into the stagnation at the end of Brezhnev era if he wants to pick apart Wolf's example? Wolf specifically states 1965 because that's the beginning of the end for the union. Um, we could get into that if you the want. The successes but... they've had and continue to have. Okay, so you're I'm dang not saying that nuance the on China. USSR Good did not grow a lot. Obviously, the USSR grew massively. Your claim is not that the USSR grew. That's not what we're arguing about. It's whether or not the USSR grew at the rate that it did due to socialism. A country that was... Well, it didn't involved. have markets! <laughs> I mean, he explained how it didn't it have did private enterprise. Do at least it was planned by the government. Socialism. Like, what do you mean? What else do you? So, <laughs> the government yeah. said, build a yeah. fucking factory, and they built a factory. Did multiple famines? A country that heavily went from okay, famines have nothing to do with socialism. Capitalist countries go through famines as well. Little industrialization. The today. United States had famines. It was called the Dust Bowl. The United States starved and killed millions of indigenous people through disease, starvation. But all those deaths don't matter because they're not white people. Like you can't talk about the growth of the United States without mentioning the millions of indigenous people that we killed through various means and displaced and abused. If you want to talk about the Harlem Door, which is a horrible crime in history. You, what about, I mean, like, you can't say that capitalism is any better. What are you talking about? It's meaningless. A state did bad shit. No one agrees with that. It, this is an absurd point. This is an absurd fucking point. A lot of industrialization and a country that engaged in a lot of imperialistic practices um, is a country that grew massively in the 20th century. To say that the imperialistic practices of the Soviet Union pale in comparison to the massive exploitation of the capitalist West. I mean, to call them both imperialist is such a tortured definition of imperialism as to be absurd. And the same is true of China today. Like their supposed exploitation of other countries just, it pales in comparison to what the US and other countries continue to do, which they, they have as long as they've been world powers. That all of their growth, or even the majority of their growth, was due to the organization of their economy and not due to factors that were independent of that organization to say there are plenty of places in the world that did not have communist parties and thus had no growth. We can look at entire swaths of Africa that were under the boot heel of Western imperialism and didn't grow at all. And, and plenty of capitalist countries that, that don't have phenomenal growth. I mean, uh, I believe by all accounts. Haiti is a capitalist country. It is also one of the poorest nations, if not the poorest nation on the earth. It's it's not just a golden ticket just because you say, oh, we're going to turn the capitalist switch and now all of a sudden we're all going to be wealthy. No. No. It, it has it has a lot to do with uh, geography and circumstance and, and uh, war and conquest and all of that stuff. You know, taking a bunch of resources that you can then used to leverage further uh, resources and, and so on and so on. Because, you know, they were being exploited by capitalist imperialists. This is stupid. Otherwise, that they wouldn't have grown, maybe at an even faster They did have rate, some markets, but economy. OK, yes, they did. Golden Gray, you're right. And they had money, too. Um, there would have but to they be some evidence provided. It wasn't, that. Um, I don't believe that that was the exchange of commodities, not um, planning. 
been adequately demonstrated. On the contrary, I believe some people have argued that the tra that Russia could have potentially grown, the USSR could have potentially grown even faster had it abandoned some of its more outdated I mean, that's, forms that's of trying to manage their economy. Um, when we bring up China, China has grown a lot can, under certain socialist policies, for sure. When we look at China, especially in the 80s and 90s, China began opening itself up to massive growth when it comes to foreign investment. China is the number two country in the world that allows for foreign direct investment. And the coalescing of all of China's state-owned, the SOE's estate. I mean, that just makes sense because they have the large, they have the second largest economy. So, of course, they have the second largest foreign direct investment. That's just obvious own enterprises into a select few and and they also have they are a, a, a sizable world power who also happens to have a lot of, of resources especially things like rare earth metals and and other valuable things uh, not to mention just the the human labor that they can leverage being a country of one billion people one one seventh of the entire earth so yeah it's going to be an attractive place to to do business industries and then the massive opening of foreign investment into that country to give other people more control over privately owned businesses has been what has caused the massive explosion that we've seen of china in terms of pulling people out of global poverty as you mentioned in the and and most of that lifting came out before that happened most of that lifting happened during the communist revolution so and in the years following so that that that, that just false. Uh, the video that you did for the Gravel Institute, you attribute that to socialist policies, but the thing that really pulled China into the 21st century in terms of economic success was the opening itself up to foreign direct investment, was the opening itself up to other economies being able to interact with them more, which are all neoliberal. By the way, op trade is not neoliberal. Trade has existed since not the exactly. beginning of humanity when the first person exchanged a coconut for a fish or whatever. Like trade is not capitalism. And, and as Wolf later points out, investment also has nothing to do with capitalism. You can, you can have all sorts of investment tools and, and invest in worker-owned cooperatives. You, you, you know, they're not mutually exclusive by any stretch. So to say that all this foreign investment is because of capitalism, that's, that's just not the case. Similarly, markets have existed for a very, very, very long time where you could go with money to a place and buy a different thing. That is not capitalist. That's not a feature of capitalism. It's a feature of human economic relations that have existed for a long time. This is like irrelevant to the point trade policies. These aren't, these aren't people-owned businesses. These aren't businesses that are ran by the workers. These are, I mean, if anything, China is a, is a government that runs the business itself. It's a state capitalist uh, economy more so than any type of socialist which is a fair point, but it's still kind of kicking our ass in, in many regards and probably will continue to grow at a faster rate than the U.S. because that command sort of uh, economy just ends up working out better um, than, than just allowing a whole bunch of, of, of privately owned uh, capitalists or, or private capitalists, that is, you know, at, at least some of that money then is, is being returned to the people. Um, investing in an actual uh, healthy workforce more so than just what well, I mean we're seem to be going in the opposite direction less and less uh, going to reinvest into the actual workers that that are the engine of uh, our economy so or communist uh, economy to say that a single party regime is, is having the workers themselves making decisions over how the any any individual business is so the question i mean you could look at our two-party system and and i mean if you're going to take a, a, a actual clear-eyed view of it both the democrats and the republicans at their core they're they are definitely outliers um but at their core, their, their planks and their principles and the way that they, they govern as a whole, they are both capitalist, you know, neoliberal parties. It's just to, it's just to a, a more and a, and a lesser degree. That's the only difference. So saying that somehow because China is a, is a one party state, well, we're basically just one and a half party state. So <laughs> we're not doing that much better in that regard. Okay, so this is just semantics, actually. We're getting not to mention, you know, how many people can actually run for office, how many people can ever muster the force of, of, of volunteers and be able to pay them and be able to run ads and, and, and on and on and on, especially in the age of uh, Citizens United. How, how many 
average citizens have any sort of access to political power at this point. I mean, you can go and complain at a local town, you know, a town hall meeting, but even then, you don't have voting power. You have the, 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 the power to vote in and out representatives, but again, they're all selected from people that already have the means to launch a successful campaign, you know? The semantics, but what we know China is, they're not liberal democ democratic capitalism with private ownership of the means of production. That's not what happened. Sorry, but that's not what worked. Is uh, running, I don't think it's fair to say. Everything good is capitalism, everything bad is socialism, but let's not moralize the economics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess one of really, the, and then really, real quick, just finishing. Your, your, just your understanding of China, wait, it, your just, understanding of China, though, is finish? really badly flawed. Can I, can I finish this, just this last part? And one thing I liked about this debate was that in the other debates that I've seen of Destiny, uh, his, his attitude towards his opponent is, is, is just so smug and, and like, I'm, I'm so much above you and, and your understanding and, and he has no problem cutting them off and no problem being uh, incredibly rude and, and, and condescending to them. But it, it, he's at least having to respect the, the work and the, the stature of, of Professor Wolf. So he's not able to just, you know, basically run all over, basically steamroll him the way he accuses him of, of, of steamrolling him. Uh, don't take the vaccine, followed me. Oop, that, I, I hope that is uh, an ironic name because if not, then, uh, I mean, thank you for the follow. I, I hope you don't live up to that name. <laughs> I'll just put it that way. This is definitely not an anti-vax channel, and we're not going to even debate that sort of thing here. So, just so you know. The, the thing that confuses me the most, and the thing that frustrates me the most, I guess, when I have s discussions with socialists, is socialism feels like this, like, this very amorphous, ever-transforming idea of what it actually is, such that I don't even know why we use the word anymore. So, I mean, not for nothing, but... Destiny does not define capitalism in this entire thing. The only definitions of any of these terms come from Wolf. And then Destiny just keeps accusing him of not defining anything. So, I'm very glad that you've acknowledged that Marx, in, in, through his labor uh, theory value analysis, was oh, absolutely flawed and was an absolute failure. I'm glad that you've acknowledged that this. the way of I analyzing... I have not acknowledged you're making this stuff up. I'm... And I, I'm glad that Wolf didn't put up with, with that sort of you know, little kid sort of debate tactics, like, oh, uh, I'm, I'm glad we agree on that, that, you know, so-and-so is a poopy head. That's just, I mean, come on, that's, that, that's not going to work with someone who actually knows their stuff. I never acknowledged anything of the work of the sort. Okay, well, the, wait, wait, I don't even you, know where I, you I, get I, this. Well, earlier you just said that we shouldn't hold ourselves captive to the thinking of, of thinkers in the 19th century in terms of what socialism is, so I assume Another thing that was never acknowledged in this debate or any of the analysis that I've seen is that capitalism, all of its core ideas, uh, are much older than socialism. So the idea that somehow the age of, of, of these ideas has any bearing on, on how, uh, you know, how we should treat them and, and how seriously we should take them, um, if that's the route that you're going to go down, then... The much newer ideas of communism, anarchism, socialism, which all came in in as a reflection of, of capitalism, as, as a critique, first and foremost, well, I mean, those would win out just by being newer ideas, right? So... So well, I just told, no, no, I didn't do that at all. I told you that socialism has a variety of theories within it. It's a broad tradition. It had to be. In the 150 years since Marx wrote, his ideas have moved into every country on this earth at different levels of economic and cultural and political life. And of course, those different people all found something valuable, but they all made their own interpretations. This is a rich, diverse tradition. It's as if you... Yeah, and, and Destiny Stands will will take all of these uh, all of this nuance and say, well, he just wasn't pinning himself down in any one particular definition. He's mushy. He moves all around. It's just amorphous. He Destiny kept throwing that word out through this entire debate, and and the thing is, 
Wolf's understanding and, and the context that he wants to bring to it can't just be fit in, in a small sound bite of this is what I believe and, and, and all these other things are wrong. He's, he's trying to give the context to, to build his entire debate and, and argument on, not just something that Destiny can then immediately attack for, for lack of nuance, <laughs> no less. You're going to decide what it is I mean when I say these things. I never said that the Marxist theory isn't valuable, that the labor theory of value doesn't apply. If you read any of the books and articles I've punked out in my life, you'd know. He, he ha and that's absolutely true. I'm, I'm in the process of going through the uh, Democracy at Work audiobook, and that's one of the one of the first parts of, I think, that even the first chapter where he, he goes through the the ideas of the labor theory of value and how they are superior to the um, the view of value that comes from uh, capitalists. The, the idea that you are paid according to your skills or you're paid according to some arbitrary thing that just happens to be decided by the people who make all the decisions about where the money goes, the people at the top. So... Um, yeah, the Wolf very much believes in the labor theory of value as a superior way of looking at things. Yeah, Newsflash, Destiny hasn't read any of the books or articles. Oh, but the exact yeah, opposite too. is the case. And can I you, want to you, correct you say... something. Wait a minute. I want to correct something about China because you keep repeating it. Okay. You know why private enterprise and private capital flows into China in the 80s and 90s? Because China had transformed itself from a place where nobody wanted to invest to a place like now where everybody does. Capitalist enterprises went there because they had a well-educated, disciplined labor force at very low wages because they had built an extraordinary infrastructure because you had a growing level of income for people to buy things. That's why General Motors pr right. produces and sells more cars in China than it does in the United States. The reason private capital went there was because they had, before the arrival, created the institutions. Every other part of the so-called third world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, who had received since the Second World War massive amounts of foreign aid were desperately... And this is one thing I, I also dislike about Destiny's style is that he focuses so much on rhetorical tactics, including, you know, he derisively puts his, his hand on... Uh, his, his hand on his chin or he, he rolls his eyes or, you know, he does all these things that have nothing to do with any sort of argument or any sort of logic or, or reasoning or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's all these performance tactics that, that make him appear to be smarter or, or you know, um, uh, in, in a more knowledgeable position, but don't actually mean that. You know, you, you look better, but you don't actually produce any better sort of thought. It's one reason I don't like debates in general. I just happen to like this one because I like Professor Wolf, really. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be featuring many debates on here because they just devolve into screaming matches that are completely unproductive and don't really. I mean, they're they're. I mean, they can be fun entertainment, but that's really their only value, in my opinion. I'd much rather focus on stuff that that actually builds people's ideas and and builds people's uh, understanding of things. And, and is productive. So I only felt this was productive because of, of Wolf, basically. Trying to do what the Chinese were doing, namely develop their country so that foreign private investment would come. China didn't get any foreign aid because they were communists and the United States didn't give them any. But they did a better job than all the countries who did get it in order to get to the point of economic development where it became interesting. And that's a much better point. You know, Destiny can try and, and hand wave all of this away as just a consequence of the entire world industrializing. But that's an actual point. He, he's talking about how, no, this is what's different about the Chinese experience. And actually, in spite of these hurdles, they managed to press through. So there must be something different about their strategy that, that can't just be explained by everyone's getting, you know, better because of all these leaps in technology. For capitalists in Japan and Europe to go there, 
You need to pretend, for reasons I do not understand, that all of the achievements I've just described didn't happen, that somehow they don't deserve the credit. Look, in the world of economics, maybe perhaps you're not familiar, we do exactly what you just said we oughtn't to do. We look at societies and say, they have a capitalist economic system, how did they do? And they have a socialist system with the different meanings of that term, and how did they do? And then we say, they're different, and part, not all, part of the story is the different system. And if I say to you that the tr socialist transition uh, tradition has multiple interpretations, let me assure you that the like capitalist tradition... Definitions of social yeah, do you ever think you're a smart class? The teacher has to let everyone know you don't know as much as you thought. Yeah, this is this is so embarrassing. This is exactly what I thought it would be, chat. This is exactly what I thought. Just Wolf going, you don't know. As much as I don't like Destiny, listening to Professor Wolf and learning from the stuff he says is worth it. Just having Professor Wolf talk yeah. is worth listening to. This is not a debate. That's this is a lecture with a unruly student yeah. we do politics here every morning all right so uh definitely didn't cover the entire debate but but that's okay that that's basically how it went i mean you, you definitely get the gist of it destiny demands definition after definition wolf supplies it maybe sometimes laboriously in 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 uh destiny's view but but still he gives them answers and then destiny just keeps asking for more definitions and they don't really get too far in the i think it was like three hours that they ended up doing it but it's a cool debate uh you can go i mean it's it's all over the internet at this point and plenty of other commentators have weighed in on it as well so uh i think that's going to do it for for my stream for tonight i, I thank you all for joining me just just getting into this kind of react dandy sort of uh political analysis stuff trying to get my hours up on Twitch, trying to finally make affiliate. I also do more educational streams every Friday night at 7 p.m. Uh, Central Time, I should say, uh, where we go through a chapter a week of an audiobook. Right now we're working on The Conquest of Bread, and it's the same same sort of thing as, as this, only it's, it's focused more on particular theory texts. Uh, so I usually have a guest on, um, and we go through it and we give our comments on it and try to relate it to the modern day, try to make it more, you know, comprehensible, especially since a lot of these things were written over a hundred years ago. The, the Conquest of Bread was written in like 1892, I believe. So yeah, just trying to, to help people read theory who, who, I mean, you always hear, oh, I should read more theory. I should read more theory. Well, I'm going to help you do it. That, that's kind of the, the the central point of, of this channel. Um, so that's what I do every Friday, like I said, and then every Sunday, kind of more whatever I feel like, you know, just trying to make things more casual, more interactive, because we can't, I can't be as interactive when I'm doing the theory stuff. It just, it just doesn't work out. It, it derails stuff too, uh, too much. Uh, so yeah, so I hope you enjoyed your time here. I thank you all for joining me again, and I hope to see you uh, next Friday, we will be doing Chapter 11 in The Conquest of Bread. I'm going to go ahead and find now someone to raid you into. So if anyone in the chat has uh, sees anyone in the in my list of, of people that I follow, or if you have someone to suggest uh, me to raid into, now is the time to, to go ahead and say so. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to pick out someone on my own. I think maybe Pinko the Bear is going to be it for tonight. But we got to see who else happens to be stri uh, streaming right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Touring news. Oh, I think I think probably I'll do Touring news. That'll be good. So we're gonna still get used to all these uh, Twitch controls and stuff. So it'll take just a second for me to raid out into Touring news. But that'll be the one there. Really cool news site. Uh, they cover a broad range of stuff, always from a leftist perspective. And he, he just started uh, um, volunteering on a urban farm. So that's been cool to see that kind of develop and that sort of thing. So uh, we will go ahead and start the raid right now.